After Superman Returns failed to captivate audiences in 2006, it was decided to learn from the lessons of that dark and gloomy Superman movie by making yet another dark and gloomy Superman movie with Man of Steel in 2013. However, this Superman movie would be more proactive and have more action to the point where half of the movie is a destructive superhero smackdown that destroys most of the city, but... Um... Yay, Superman, I guess? Man of Steel is an updated origin story of the Superman mythology, where we see Clark, played by Henry Cavill, growing up as a troubled young man, trying to stay off the grid and come to terms with the fact that he's different and has many spectacular superpowers. However, when Kryptonian fugitive General Zod arrives on Earth to unleash chaos and devastation, Clark is forced to come forward and reveal himself to the world as Superman where Superman and Zod engage in one of the most destructive battles put on film. Some people think that Man of Steel is just as morbid and as unengaging as Superman Returns. However, there are those who love it and see it as a deep and meaningful and refreshing update on the Superman mythos. So today we're going to look into 10 things that you probably didn't know about this polarizing Superman movie. So, let's check it out. Number 10. The original concept was to be a trilogy that was the Lord of the Rings trilogy meets the Godfather trilogy. In 2008, it was decided to reboot the Superman movie franchise after the disappointing reception of Superman Returns. I can remember for a while, the franchise was kind of in limbo and no one really knew what was going on. There were rumours that there would be a sequel to Superman Returns, complete with Brandon Ralph, and that this one would be more action-packed, with further rumours that Terrence Stamp would be returning as General Zod. However, Warner Brothers had started on creating a new cinematic universe for The Last Son of Krypton, and were looking to comic book writers and Hollywood filmmakers on how to successfully reboot the series. At one stage, Matthew Vaughn pitched an idea for a grand and epic Superman trilogy, with each movie being released a year apart, taking inspiration from the Lord of the Rings trilogy. He was also taking inspiration from the Godfather trilogy, which would explore the entire life cycle of Superman, beginning with his Kryptonian origins and ending with a supernova which causes older Superman to lose his powers. However, things really started to take effect during the early production of The Dark Knight Rises, where that movie's writer, David S. Goyer, pitched his idea of a modern Superman movie to Christopher Nolan, which is pretty much the Man of Steel. And Nolan loved it and wanted to work with it. So Nolan, Goyer, and Emma Thomas, who also produced the Dark Knight trilogy, pitched their ideas to Warner Brothers. And so they were hired to spearhead this new Superman movie. It would have made sense hiring Nolan, Goya, and Thomas, as the Dark Knight trilogy was hugely successful. So hopefully these guys would have been able to deliver that same kind of success to the Superman brand. Number 9. Superman could have been directed by Batman. No seriously, I'm not kidding. The decision was made quite early in the production of Man of Steel that this Superman movie could also hint at other superheroes in the DC lineup of superhero characters, with the possibility of a shared cinematic DC universe. This was no doubt due to, to what was happening at Marvel at that time with the launch of the MCU. At one stage, there was even a suggestion that Man of Steel could be part of the same universe as the Dark Knight trilogy, but that decision was wisely vetoed. Nope, this was to be a new universe from fresh. There were several directors who were considered to directing the movie, including Robert Zemeckis, Matt Reeves, Duncan Jones, Guillermo del Toro, and Darren Aronofsky. But the most interesting choice of director was Ben Affleck himself, who would actually later go on to play Batman in this new DC universe. 
At that time, Affleck was proving to be a successful director, as well as an actor, having directed The Town and Argo, but he turned the job down, having never had the experience of directing a movie of that scope and scale before. Finally, Zack Snyder was hired as director, as he had proved that he did have the chops to direct a movie of this magnitude, thanks to previously directing the Dawn of the Dead remake, 300, Watchmen, and Sucker Punch. Number 8. A New Dawn of Justice, A New Soups So as I always say in these videos, say it with me, one big issue plaguing the production is who could be the face of a new Superman of a new era. Well, several actors were considered for the part, including Jamie Dornan, Colin O'Donoghue, Matthew Good, Army Hammer, no relation to MC Hammer, and Tyler Hoechlin. Who would actually go on to play Superman in the TV series Superman and Lois? British actor Henry Cavill got involved in the Superman legacy all the way back in the early 2000s when he auditioned to play Superman in the cancelled Superman Flyby movie. You can even see behind the scenes audition footage of Cavill wearing the Superman Flyby costume. There are even some claims that he was actually cast as Superman for Flyby before the project changed and evolved into Superman Returns. Cavill auditioned for Superman Returns 2, but lost to Brandon Ralph. But when it came to Man of Steel, Cavill was successful. Cavill had two shirtless scenes in the movie, but he refused to use steroids or muscular digital enhancements. So he achieved his muscular look thanks to a lot of working out and a lot of protein shakes. Now I could look like this, but burritos exist. As for his performance, well, I think Cavill is great. Firstly, he has a grand superhero look. A look that screams Superman, but also while having his own look, not just being a Christopher Reeve clone. Yes, there are some scenes at the start of the movie where the character feels like a clone of Bruce Wayne from Batman Begins, but that's more the way the character was written than Cavill's performance. But Cavill brings a lot of heart and feels genuine, and also like a beacon of hope that you can look up to. So, which Superman do I think is better out of Brandon Ralph and Henry Cavill? Well, I like them both equally, but for different reasons. But, I do think that Cavill definitely has an advantage of him being his own Superman, rather than being a Christopher Reeve clone. And not spying on Lois also helps. Number 7. A Man of Steel, but not Red Trunks. So it's here we get to the Superman suit of Man of Steel, and for the most part, I really like it. It looks futuristic and alien, but also ancient and timeless at the same time. I also really like the material. It often has a shine to it, making it almost look metallic, literally making Superman look like a Man of Steel. And unlike Superman Returns, I feel like they got the reds and blues right this time round. And it's generally a better looking costume. It looks iconic. Hey, at least this time, Superman's cape is red and not brown. But I will say this, I think I like the suit more in the behind the scenes footage than I do the actual movie. Because in the movie itself, it looks like they darkened the colours to the point where sometimes it looks black. And when that happens, the suit doesn't really stand out. It's like you've got a great suit here guys, use it, don't try and hide it. It's Superman, it's okay to use reds and blues, that's who he is. I think the costume would improve with adjustments in future installments of the DCU. But in general, I do really like this modern take on an iconic costume. An early prototype of the suit doesn't have the yellow in the S logo, but it's all blue. Which is an interesting look. Also, is it just me, but in this early prototype, does the S look kind of wonky? In many ways, this suit also has several similarities to the unused Superman flyby suit. Kind of like an evolution of that suit, I guess. Zack Snyder had attempted to add the red underpants, feeling that they are a part of Superman's iconography. But it was decided not to use them, as they just didn't go with the atmosphere of the movie, making Man of Steel the first live-action Superman to not use Superman's iconic red trunks. Overall, this suit is a huge improvement over the Superman Returns one, and creates its own iconic look for a new generation of Superman fans. I just really wish they didn't dim out its colours in the actual film. 
Also, there's some interesting behind-the-scenes photos of Henry Cavill wearing a more traditional Superman suit. Many claim that this is the Christopher Reeve suit, but I don't know. If you look at it closely, it's similar, but not the same suit. You know, just throwing it out there. Number six, the rest of the cast. When it came to casting Lois Lane, several actresses were considered, including Mila Kunis, Kristen Stewart, and Olivia Wilde. But it was Amy Adams who got the part. She originally auditioned to play Lois in Superman Returns, and it's great to once again see a Lois with flair and sass, which Adams brings to the role. Something that was desperately missing from the Kate Bosworth Lois. But Adams also injected a lot of heart and sincerity into the part, and has great chemistry with Cavill. Once again, the Lois and Superman chemistry was really lacking in the previous movie. When it came to Superman's father, Jor-El, actors considered for the part include Clive Owen and Sean Penn. But Russell Crowe got the part, and definitely has the soft-spoken nobility and command of the character. The irony being, Marlon Brando previously played the character, and when Crow was a young man, he released an album called I Want To Be Just Like Marlon Brando. <laughs> well, I guess now he was. Michael Shannon was cast as the villainous General Zod, who had to completely recreate the character to breathe new life into it to get it away from the iconic performance of Terence Stamp yelling out Neil before Zod, creating more of a complex character. Other potential Zods include Daniel Day-Lewis, and Viggo Mortensen. I feel like Shannon has a great villainous look, and this time the character has more of a rhyme and reason for his evil deeds. Then there's the character, Feora, who until now I actually thought was the Ursa character from the Reeve movies. Just an updated version, but no, she's a different character called Feora. Just goes to show how much attention I was paying. Actresses considered for the part include Rosamund Pike and Diane Kruger. No relation to Freddy Kruger. It was Gal Gadot who was cast, but then she had to drop out as she became pregnant. So instead, the part was cast with a German actress whose name I really can't pronounce and I'm not even going to try because I know I'm just going to butcher it. But yeah. But as we all know, Gadot would eventually go on to be cast as Wonder Woman. Man of Steel cast several well-known veteran actors, including Lawrence Fishburne as Perry White, Diane Lane as Martha Kent, and Kevin Costner as Jonathan Kent. I can remember at the time Costner was getting tons of praise for his sincere performance as Pa Kent. In fact, British film critic Mark Kermode claimed that Costner stole the show and that it's basically his movie. Number 5. Filming the Man of Steel the shoot for Man of Steel started in August 2011 and would last till February 2012. The shoot mainly took place around Chicago and California, with on-set filming taking place at Vancouver, Canada, namely Burnaby's Mammoth Studios. Hey, that's a pretty badass name for a studio. There was pressure to release the movie as a 3D IMAX release. 3D was the craze at the time, which started with Avatar. Zack Snyder didn't really want to film in 3D due to the filming limitations, so instead he opted to shoot in 2D and to give the movie a 3D conversion in post. He also chose to shoot the movie on film as opposed to digital, in order to create a big movie experience. Some of the movie was even shot using handheld devices, in order to give the movie a documentary style, which admittedly is an interesting approach for a Superman film. And I guess it was done to add a sense of realism and grit, rather than just looking like a polished Hollywood movie. And yes, I have to say it, I'm not a big fan of 3D movies, especially 3D conversions. I think if you have a great movie and it looks great, that's all that should matter. I can remember watching Man of Steel in a movie theatre in its 3D conversion. Now I actually wanted to see it in 2D, but that option wasn't available. And I was just really unimpressed with the 3D. Like you had scenes of Superman flying around, but because of the 3D conversion, he looked really tiny. You had a really small, itty bitty Superman flying around. Number 4, Easter Eggs. As in, things that are hidden in the movie, I don't mean actual easter eggs. So woven throughout Man of Steel are several easter eggs, which hint at a wider expanded DC universe, as well as the Superman universe. Despite Superman's greatest foe, Lex Luthor, not appearing in the movie, the character's LexCorp logo can be seen in some shots. 
as well as the Wayne Enterprises logo. Also, a logo for Blaze Comics can be seen, which is a fictional comic brand from the Booster Gold comics. Aaron Smolinski, who played Baby Kal-El in the 1978 Superman movie, has a cameo as an army officer, and it's said that the Kryptonian spaceship that Clark finds in the ice is in fact Supergirl's spaceship. Tucked away in the movie is also a sign that says keep calm and call Batman, and the comedian's badge from Watchmen, henceforth the smiley face with the splatter of blood on it. Some viewers of the film have even spotted what they feel is a subliminal Christopher Reeve cameo, in a scene where Superman is straining from a bombardment of energy coming from the world engine. We see a close-up of Superman's face, where many believe that for a split second, Reeves' face is subtly superimposed over Cavill's face, in a literal blink-and-you'll-miss-it cameo. Now, I've gone through the footage very carefully, and yes, for a brief microsecond, Cavill's face does kind of look like Reeves' face, but that could just be lighting effects causing that to happen, I'm not too sure. It's neither been officially confirmed or denied as to whether or not the face of Christopher Reeve appears in this moment. But I'll now turn to you guys watching and ask, what do you think is going on here? Is this a cameo or does it just look like Reeve? I like to think that the Christopher Reeve Superman is in his own dimension, his own universe, and that he could sense that the Superman of the Snyderverse needed help. So he telepathically gave him some of his energy. So that's my fan fiction for the day. Number three, Music of Steel. The music for Man of Steel was composed by Hans Zimmer, who previously scored the Dark Knight trilogy, as well as Gladiator, the Pirates of the Caribbean films, and Inception. According to Wikipedia, at first he was denying any and all rumours that he was scoring a new Superman film, right up until the trailers came out, which of course used his music. One of the most difficult challenges that no doubt faced Zimmer was how to create a new sound for a new Superman cinematic world, and to not make it resemble the iconic John Williams Superman march. Well, I feel like Zimmer took a less is more approach, where the music is more subtle and less bombastic than what we've heard before. But I think that's a good thing, as it still has lots of heart, and does still have a sense of triumph without blasting about how triumphant it is. It's like Zimmer deliberately went out to not sound like anything done before, and to give the movie its own identity and dignity. But also at the same time, sounding Superman-ish. I think the music is definitely a highlight of the movie, and I love the main theme, and how it starts off with soft piano notes and builds up into something truly epic and wonderful. The music marked a new era of Superman. However, there were some elements of a new Superman era that the studio were worried about. Namely, <laughs> of all things, Henry Cavill's hairy chest. Yes, this apparently was a worry. It was felt that within the imagery of the Superman iconography, that Superman doesn't have a hairy chest, and that Cavill should shave his chest for the shirtless scenes. Such a silly thing to worry about. However, Cavill got to keep his hairy chest when he argued that in the Death of Superman comics, you can see that Supes did indeed have a hairy chest, and that the Death of Superman is a part of iconic Superman imagery. Yeah, take that. So because of that, the chest rug stayed. Yep, when I woke up this morning, I really had no idea that today I'll be talking about Henry Cavill's chest hairs, but yet here we are. Number two, marketing the Man of Steel. So to help market The Man of Steel, it was merchandise galore, with Superman's production making $160 million of tie-in memorabilia alone. There was, of course, The Man of Steel action figures, which were released by Mattel. Now you have this standard Superman figure, where Superman seems to have ripped a motorbike in half. Wow, that bike must have really pissed him off. Who knows, maybe it belonged to that guy in the bar. And there's other characters like General Zod. All the figures look pretty good, and have great detail, but with some of these figures, they really took creative liberties, especially when it comes to Superman's attire. Like, I don't remember in The Man of Steel seeing Superman wear this, or this, and this, or this, or even this. And what's this? Now he's destroying a car door? Superman in the toy world really doesn't like motor vehicles, does he? All these variants of Superman not seen in the film is like Kenner's 1989 Batman all over again. 
Then there was also Man of Steel Lego sets, where now you can relive thousands of people being brutally killed in Metropolis in Lego format, with inventive sets where Superman must battle General Zod and save Lois, once again in Lego format. Kids at home could also dress up like characters from Man of Steel. And just as with Superman Returns, there was a prequel comic, which explains the build-up of events in Man of Steel. Which is interesting as Man of Steel itself is an origin story. Hmm, a prequel to an origin story, sure, why not I guess. The artwork in this comic is amazeballs, I'll give it that. But sadly, it was only released digitally. Now I'm with Stan Lee when he said real comics are better than digital ones, as there's nothing like reading a comic while holding it in your hand. Or at least he said something along those lines. Number 1. Highest Grossing Superman Movie Man of Steel was released in June 2013, and everyone was eager to see what this new Superman universe would be like. And the movie was a massive success, bringing in $668 million on a budget that sat somewhere between $225 to $250 million, which was a huge improvement from Superman Returns box office intake of $391 million. Man of Steel would go on to become the third highest grossing movie of 2013, behind Iron Man 3 and Hunger Games Catching Fire, as well as the highest grossing Superman movie and second highest grossing reboot movie after The Amazing Spider-Man, which came out one year earlier. However, its critical response was very average, with Man of Steel becoming divisive among fans. There are some who love it and stand by it as being a great modernization of Superman, but there are those who just found it underwhelming and underdeveloped, with a finale which just consists of buildings and city infrastructure being destroyed, looking just like what we've already seen in Michael Bay's Transformer movies. So where do I stand with Man of Steel? Well, to me, it has many of the same problems as Superman Returns. Just like that movie, it feels very gloomy and miserable, and is trying too hard to be all dark and serious. Look, all I want is a fun, uplifting Superman movie. One that makes you feel happy and optimistic, is that too much to ask? <laughs> a fun adventure as opposed to a depressing one. I think the review in the Boston Globe summed it up the best, when it said, quote, What's missing from this Superman saga is a sense of lightness, of pop joy. It's like they took Superman Returns and said, right, we need to learn from this and to make changes. Now everyone said that Superman Returns was boring, so we'll just add in action. Lots and lots and lots and lots of action. Yeah, that'll fix it up. But it's like in doing that, they forgot to make it intriguing and captivating. In fact, most of the movie's third act is nothing but action and bangs and crashes. And yet the movie still feels kind of hollow and empty. I guess, at the end of the day, more heart was needed other than bangs and crashes. I think that Superman Returns and Man of Steel are like a yin and yang of each other, where one succeeds, the other lacks, and so forth. Yes, Man of Steel is a better looking movie, and has more action and excitement, and the special effects are definitely an improvement, but it doesn't quite have the heart and growth of Returns. But, Returns is just really boring and not proactive, and features Superman spying on people. See what I mean? Where one fails, the other triumphs. If you scramble the ideas from both movies together, and leave out what didn't work with both of them, you'll probably actually have a great Superman movie. So like Superman Returns, I actually do think that Man of Steel is a good movie. It's well made, has relatable characters, and more spectacle. But there is also something empty about it, something that is stopping it from being super. I hope maybe one day we can get a Superman movie that isn't trying to be a reflection on the gloomy, depressing real world and to give us something fun and joyful. This is, after all, Superman, a guy who flies around in a red cape. It doesn't have to be realistic or a reflection on modern times. In Man of Steel, Superman said that his S stands for hope. So let's start seeing some of that hope, please. It's interesting because I did a poll on the Minty Facebook page and asked people which movie do they think is the better movie out of Superman Returns or Man of Steel. And the comments section was literally Man of Steel, Superman Returns, Man of Steel, Superman Returns, Man of Steel, so, you know, so on and so forth, you get the point. Once again, I do think that the cast is a highlight. 
I really like both Amy Adams as Lois Lane and Henry Cavill as Superman. And I think it's a shame that Cavill wasn't given his own solo follow-up movie, as I feel that although Man of Steel wasn't quite there yet, it was in the right direction, and that there was more potential of a terrific Superman movie with him at the helm. I know a lot of people claim him to be their favourite Superman, and yep, I get that. He brings a great presence to his Superman. And now that this cinematic universe is coming to an end, makes this even more tragic, and like a wasted opportunity. So, to conclude, I commend Man of Steel for not relying on the past, and being brave enough to do its own thing, and for its terrific casting and impressive set pieces. Once again, I do think it's a good film, and a step in the right direction. Sadly though, just like Superman Returns, it left me feeling empty, and I quickly forgot about it after watching it. It didn't stay with me too much longer after seeing it. As with the previous movie, to me, it just wasn't very super. A good movie, just not Superman levels of good yet. I would say that I like Returns and Man of Steel the same, but for different reasons. And some may disagree with me, but that's okay, we're all allowed to have different opinions, I still love you all. But one day, we will get a Superman movie that brings back that popcorn factor. Anyway, I'm Minty, and say what you want to say about Man of Steel, at least it didn't have that horrible filter put over the picture like Returns did. <laughs> See ya!